TMZ TV. Hey, this is the arrogant bastard Martin Zender. Welcome to the show. Now, I'm going to get to the email I talked about yesterday. No, it's not an email. It's a comment on my uh, video concerning the pirate, concerning this terrible teaching of the non pre existence of Christ, which is so easy to disprove. And I, this gentleman, I don't know if I've met him or not. I'm embarrassed many times. I meet somebody and I say, oh, it's nice to meet you. And they say, oh, we've met five times. Oh, oh, haha, <laughs> sorry. I'm not too good at that stuff sometimes. But this gentleman, his name is Dennis and his, his handle is Dennis Holm, 7301. I don't know if that's abbreviated that it's Dennis Holmes or if Holm is the whole last name. I'm just going to call him De- Dennis. But as I read these comments, and one of them I just saw five minutes ago was an answer to my comment yesterday. I want to set forth this as an example of how members of the body of Christ dialogue. This is so great. This is how it's done. People can maybe poke one another a little bit, barb one another a little bit, challenge one another. And then be gentlemanly, shake hands, and fellowship in the faith. I thank God for this man and for his posts. So let's all learn something from this. And in the meantime, besides showing you how members of the body of Christ can disagree and be civil about it, even if they hold strong feelings, uh, Besides that, I make, I think, some decent points in answering Dennis's comments. And then he makes more points after my points. And so I really like this. So this is what set me off last night. I responded a little hastily, I have to admit. But I really can't take any of it back. I mean, I did, There's one line I wanted to take back that, that I wrote. I will to show you what that line was but i didn't have time because by the time i got back to edit it maybe a half hour later dennis had already seen it and said ah sender anyway this is good you ready i recently heard a line that i took to heart motivation is the master of reason i see i don't even know what that means right away i really have to think about that um and i don't consider myself a dumb person i'm fairly intelligent I'm well read. Motivation is the master of reason. You see, already I got set off because that seemed philosophical to me. You see how quickly I make a judgment? It's not always good. Sometimes it saves me, though. Why do we believe a statement to be true? Do we have proof? I took a few math classes a number of years ago. Arithmetic is generally a deductive reasoning process applied to observation of our material surroundings where proof is measurable. Aside from that, any claim or expectation of proof is based either on ignorance or arrogance. Now, see, I kind of bristled at that, too. And I, I, I know, I know what he's saying is that we don't have what he would call measurable proof. But the spirit of God that inspires faith is so strong in us that we see the word of God as proof. I'm going to get to the definition of faith because this is a tricky situation here. Is faith not knowing? that something is true, not knowing for sure that something is true, or is faith believing that something is true even while not being able to observe it, even while that thing's, uh, even while that thing's manifestation is still in the future? This is a very important distinction. And I'm glad Dennis brought this up because I think he's on the wrong side of the distinction. You may think I'm on the wrong side of the distinction. That's fine. I'm going to lay out my case. So let me continue. Aside from that, any claim or expectation of proof is based either on ignorance or arrogance. (laughs) Dennis thinks I'm on the arrogant side. 
Okay, but the omniscient God alone has proof. Yes, and the omniscient God gives us what I consider to be proof. Okay, anyway, the best we can do is faith. That's true, but we have to define faith. The best we can do is faith, which by definition, and here we go with the definition of faith, this is important, requires we admit we do not know the statement we believe to be true. We, we don't know the statement we believe to be true is true. I disagree. That got me shuddering as well. And then this statement, this really put me over the edge. Reason floats on a sea of very limited perception and language with various interpretations and definition. Reason floats on a sea of perception. Reason floats on a sea of perception. See, that's just too esoteric, too philosoph philosophical for me. See, I'm the mayor of Realville. I like concrete words and concrete statements. And I would say that reason is a gift given us by God to believe stuff that he tells us in the word. I don't know about floating on a sea of limited perception. I don't know about that. I don't know how limited a perception is of a person who is full of the spirit of God. That person doesn't have a limited perception. That person's perception is heightened to a great degree. And then this language with various interpretations and definitions. But Dennis, that is true of the English language. The English language has different definitions. You know, I hit the bat with my bat. It's the same word, two different definitions. But this is why God did not reveal himself in English. God revealed himself in Hebrew and Greek, which are very precise languages, which do not suffer from that anomaly of same word meaning different things. Each word has a precise definition, and no other word has the same definition. And each word has one definition, not multiple. So Dennis is basing some of his ideas here on the English language, which is flawed. Our experience gives us confidence in our reason. Well, no, my experience flies in the face of the truth I know that God has concerning me. Seated among the celestials and Christ chosen beforehand, I believe this stuff to the nth degree, and yet my experience flies in the face of it. So maybe to the person without spirit and i'm not saying this is dennis i think this man has the spirit of god in him but one's experience would be the only way to measure one's confidence in one's reason yes, i don't buy into that and he gives an example of that statement the chair we choose to sit in is not likely to break however it may break and we may still choose to sit in it if we do not see its weakness tradition is like a chair with legs made of rationalizations oh at that point I couldn't wait to answer. Tradition is like a chair with legs made of rash rationalizations. Where do you hear my response to that? I'm going to read it in a moment. Mm. I still don't understand that. I've been thinking about it for 24 hours, dreamed about it last night, still don't know what it means. In this particular case, the chair has many legs. Uh, the case of, is the preexistence of Christ true? Or is it not true? Aaron Welch simply pointed out the rationalizations upon which all of its legs are carefully crafted. No idea what that means. And I'm not sure Aaron Welch would even agree with that. Aaron Welch, I know what you did. You simply pointed out the rationalizations upon which all the chair's legs are carefully crafted. Aaron Welch would go, I did? When? When did I do that? It, this probably makes sense to Dennis. I, I'm, I'm sure this is a brilliant statement. This is not a stupid statement. I have a feeling. I think it's a philosophical statement. But see, my brain power is strained enough understanding the literal words of God, which God wants us to understand the literal words of God. He wrote words that are literal, unless there's a reason to take them figuratively. That's why you have to know figures of speech. Didn't mention that yesterday, but yes, a knowledge of figures of speech is vital if you're going to understand the word of God. 
That's not very spiritual, Martin. Yes, it is. Stop it. Pirate appears correct. Pirate appears correct? How does the pirate appear correct? The pirate obviously twisted a scripture passage, 1 Peter 1, 19, which I showed on my show, saying that it proved the pre-existence of Christ, and I showed you that the pre-existence of Christ was not even in the context, and that the passage wasn't even talking about Christ. Pirate appears correct. Based on what? The rationalization of a chair? I don't get it. And then he says tradition with three dots. What's that called? An ellipsis? Tradition. Don't get it. Why do we believe a statement? Dennis asks, I am largely ignorant and believe we all have yet to see a big piece or several pieces of this puzzle. <laughs> we must look into our own hearts. Admit our vulnerability. Okay. And extend grace to those who see something differently. To do otherwise is to expose our arrogance. God only knows. The rest of us live by faith. Okay. Got a problem with... With... We all have yet to see a big piece or several pieces of this puzzle. This is exactly what the free will people say. When we bring out proof after proof after proof text, and there's a proof text, proof. In this life, we have proof that's not based on my experience, based on the Word of God, which the Spirit of God causes me to understand. We have proof the free will is bunk and that God is sovereign. He is doing all things in accord with the counsel of his will. And what do they say? Well, this is a mystery. This is much bigger than you people are realizing. You're trying to make it simple. See, when you corner them, they, they always say, well, you're trying to make this too simple, but this is complicated. This is a big puzzle. Nobody can understand it. That's what Dennis is doing here. I'm largely ignorant and believe but well, you don't have to be, Dennis, and believe we all have yet to see a big piece or several pieces. No, no. I'm not saying we know everything, but we know huge pieces of the puzzle. I got into this on the video called The Big Five, The Big Five Beliefs. These are huge pieces of the puzzle, the sovereignty of God, the outcome of the universe, that God is working in a series of eons, the meaning of death, the purpose of Christ. My God, how is any of this a puzzle? We must look into our own hearts. This is that is, mm, I'm sorry, Dennis. Look into our own hearts. For what, revelation? We have to look into our, our own hearts to understand whether Christ preexisted or not. Do I have to look into my heart? Do I have to get into a room, turn the light down low, play some quiet music again, and look into myself, be introspective to decide whether or not Jesus Christ preexisted? Or do I put on my glasses, open the word of God, and believe what I read? It's not a puzzle, Dennis. It's a revelation. Scripture's not a puzzle. Yes, we all have things that we still need to know. God hasn't told us everything, but what he has told us are huge revelations. As Ray Princeton would say, huge revelations. God is in the business of revealing himself, of telling us things. Paul says that our, our eyes are enlightened and that we are no longer looking at Christ in a mirror, but face to face. In Paul's gospel, there are no more mysteries. There are no more secrets. Paul is the exposer of secrets. And God's not holding himself back with us. I mean, absolutely, of course, he's holding himself back in a way, but Dennis is saying that even on this topic, he's commenting on this topic, on this topic, well, it's just a... Big puzzle. We can't really know. It's all the rationalizing legs of a chair. I mean, we're floating on a sea of rationalizations and reasons. It's like, huh? Looking in our own hearts? Admitting our vulnerability? Well, we're all vulnerable at one point or another. And extend grace to those who see something differently? Yes, extend grace. But my friend, grace is not nice. Grace doesn't mean nice. Grace doesn't imply niceness. I hate those bumper stickers, and I think Dennis might have one of these on his car. Be nice. Oh, my God, I hate those bumper stickers. Be nice. Like, that's the only thing that matters. Don't be sure. Don't be positive. Don't make declarative statements. Just be nice. Don't insult anyone. Don't make anyone feel bad. Don't tell anybody that they're wrong, because everybody's right in their own way. 
Just look into your own heart and try to see that life is one big puzzle. No one can know anything for certain. And if you come across here, Martin Zander, telling us that you think you know certain things, well, I'm afraid you're just arrogant. Here's a bumper sticker that says, be nice. Put about five of them on your car. My comment. <laughs> you ready for this? See, I just, I said, what the heck is this? I'm sorry, but this is a load of philosophy. We can know truth by studying laws of language and scriptural interpretation. Laws of scriptural interpretation. And of course, the Holy Spirit of God enlightens our brains. And then I quote him, motivation is the master of reason. This sounds like a good article for Reader's Digest. But it has nothing to do with the topic at hand. Quoting him again, we admit that we do not know the statement we believe to be true is true. Huh? I write. And I quote him again, any claim of proof is based either on ignorance, on ignorance or arrogance. And then I ask him, who taught you this? Kant? Marx? Voltaire? Satan? You certainly didn't get it from the word of God. This is not a puzzle as you claim it to be. And no, we must not look into our own hearts. We must look at the scripture and believe it. And then I quote him at the end. This is the one. This is the statement I wanted to edit after I thought about it for 30 minutes. I wrote this. I went to the gym. I'm doing my swim and I'm thinking, I shouldn't have written that. I shouldn't have written that. I shouldn't have written that. Came home. He had already seen it. I quoted him, I, him saying, I am largely ignorant. And then my comment upon that was, this is one statement that I agree with. Oh, sorry, Dennis, but I couldn't resist. Let's look at the definition of faith, shall we? Before I go into, there, there's more. There is more. Ladies and gentlemen, there's always more here on MZTB. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is an assumption of what is being expected. Now, don't get thrown off by assumption. It just means you're assuming something to be true. It doesn't mean you doubt that it's true. And... To show that, the next clause locks it down. Faith is a conviction concerning matters which are not being observed. A conviction. I'm convicted about things I read in Scripture. And it's not the fact that I don't know whether or not they're true. I know they're true because I expect them. You notice the word hope is not here. An assumption of what is being hoped for. No, I'm not hoping for anything. I'm expecting things. And assumption is good here. Why am I assuming the things I believe to be true? Because God is the one saying them, and God is trustworthy, and his word is miraculous. And it's in order, and it's perfect. And the only problem is they're not being observed. See, that's the issue. That's where faith comes in. Faith doesn't come. Let me say this again. Faith does not mean we don't believe something is true. Dennis said that's what faith is. Faith is believing something is true that we don't know is true. No. Faith is believing something is true that we know is true, but that we do not yet observe. Okay, back to this dialogue. Before I had read Dennis's reply, I wrote this. No, he wrote this while I was swimming. It appears humility is not your strong suit. <laughs> All the hostility is fired from your camp. That might be saying something. Hmm. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, I followed up that first response with another response before I went to the gym. That, yeah. Before I even gave him a chance to answer, I wanted to follow up. And this is what I, I followed up with. See, I, I was kind of apologizing right after I sent this. You'll see what I mean. I said, I'm sorry I was a little harsh there, Dennis, but this really got me spiritually agitated. This is exactly what Paul warns against. It's exactly what Paul warns the saints against in Colossians 2.8. Paul says, Beware that no one shall be despoiling you through philosophy and empty seduction in accord with human tradition, in accord with the elements of the world, that is the reasoning of the world, the philosophies of the world, the systems of the world, and not in accord with Christ. To live is Christ. It's Christ. Christ is not a philosopher. He's a proclaimer of truth. Thus saith the Lord. Verily, verily, I say to you. 
And then I said to Dennis, despoiling is robbing. This is the word Paul uses. Be aware that no one shall be despoiling you through philosophy. Philosophy has a potential of robbing you of truth. This is what it did to my son, Luke. He went to Miami University of Ohio for one year. Smart kid, brilliant kid. And he took philosophy and they, they took his faith from him. It robbed him. Robbed him. I would rather somebody broke into his dorm and stolen everything he owned. But no, he got robbed of his faith. He got robbed of Christ. Because Paul says that. Beware that no one be despoiling you through philosophy, through philosophy and empty seduction. Philosophy is empty. It is empty. Nothing good about it. The spoiling is robbing. Your philosophy will rob anyone reading it and taking it seriously. It will rob them of pursuing truth. Oh, we just can't know truth. Things we think we know, we don't really know. Math is a different story. Of course, you can understand math. Two plus two is four. But when God says he's the savior of all humanity, yeah, you can't really prove that deductively. It's not like math. Oh, if only this was math. No, it is math. This is more precise than math. And that is proven with gematria, by the way. Math is all through the scriptures, Dennis. It's called gematria. Look that up. You might know about it. Numbers in scripture, they're all through it, even under, even under the text, in the subtexts. And then I quote him, Tradition is like a chair with legs made of rationalization. <laughs> Tradition is like a chair made of rationalizations. Good grief. I would rather believe that rationalizations are traditional chair legs. See, I just totally mocked that saying at the end. That's what I do. I use satire to make my point. I mock the pretensions of humanity. Dennis may think I'm arrogant, but mm, philosophy is arrogant as hell. I would rather believe that rationalizations are traditional chair legs. <laughs> Okay, and while I was at the gym, he wrote, it appears humility is not your, your strong suit. That was a nice way of saying I'm an arrogant prick. I appreciated that gentle touch there. Uh, humility, you're not really into that humility thing, are you, Martin? Mm. That's a nice way to say it, you know. All the hostility is fired from your camp. That might be saying something. So I answered him. I got back from the gym. My hair was still a little wet. I still got chlorine in my hair probably, but... I said, yes, Dennis, I was just stucking in here to soften that a bit. Thank you for being gracious. I was planning on taking out the part where I agreed with you when you said you were largely ignorant. I wanted to remove that before you got to it, but you're quick like St. Nick. So the damage is done, so I might as well leave it in. Sorry about that. But this is not about humility. It's about being pissed at a philosophical answer to a scriptural question. Your post smacked of moral relativism. Well, none of us can really know anything, and those who say they do are arrogant. So, I must be the most arrogant of all because I know lots of stuff about God. But you see, that's wrong that I'm arrogant because of that. It's completely wrong, which is why I still really despise your post. I don't despise you just philosophy. Heck, I don't even know you, so how can I not like you? I've been battling this sort of thing for years, this sort of, let's just be nice and not make other people mad by saying that we know things because then it will make the other people feel like they don't know things. I've been fighting that for decades. It's terrible. I do what I do in order to fight this sort of thing. So you see, it is has absolutely nothing to do with either humility or arrogance. Nothing. And Dennis said that hostility is on our side of the fence. I said, I will be hostile against philosophy all day. I finished this way. Having said all this, I never want to be rude. Mm, yes, this is a different thing. So please accept my apology for any rudeness that slipped in under me knowing a lot of stuff. Grace and peace. And then just this morning, I got this. I'm going to close here. Wow, it's still so good. Okay, boy. He says, I'm not terribly familiar with the subject of philosophy. 
I was simply raised in a rather legalistic Protestant tradition. Uh, this explains some things. The only way I've been able to escape the hold it had on me was to let go the dogma while allowing for the intended goodwill from those friends and family who still imposed it on me. So he's not into dogma. This is a problem people have. They, the, uh, the religions of their uh, childhood were, were so dogmatic, or even of their adulthood, they're so dogmatic, dogmatic. And But the, the problem was the dogmatism concerned things that were lies, like eternal torment, free will. You have to repent or God's going to burn you for eternity. The dogmatic statements, dogma, dogma. And so when people then find the truth, they tend to want to, the, the, the pendulum swings the wrong way. And now they say, well, I can't be dogmatic about the truth because this, see, I can see right through this. I can't be dogmatic now because I was dogmatic before and I was wrong. But Dennis never considers the fact that he could be dogmatic about being right. Dogmatism is not the problem. Error is the problem. Being dogmatic about the wrong things is the problem. If anyone was dogmatic, it was Paul. To the point that anybody that brought anything different, he went after them, after their teachings, their false teachings, like an assassin. We see that in Galatians. Paul's like an assassin going after the circumcisionists for daring to suggest to the Galatians that they're not perfected by faith, uh, by, by, yeah, by faith, they have to do the law. There you go. The dogma harmed him, and he's thrown away dogma, in spite of the fact that he now apparently holds important parts of the truth. I do have confidence in the love and power of God. Oh, that's good. I don't feel the need to prove my point of view to anyone who can't engage in a civil discussion regarding a pondering of the evidence. See, I, I have this desperate need to prove my point. <laughs> desperate need. I, I don't think that's a flaw. It, it, it's a flaw if my motives are selfish, and it's a flaw if I'm trying to prove a point that's unrelated to God and his Christ. Uh, but he goes on to say, I don't feel the need to prove my point to anyone who can't engage in a civil discussion. Okay, I agree with that. Civil discussion is important. And that's what we're having here. It's it's, it's civil. It's harsh, maybe a little bit hard, but it's civil. This is how you do it. I told you this at the beginning. This is how it's done right here. I only respond to your videos because your mockery and intimidation breaks my heart. My friend, mockery and intimidation. No, mockery. Forget intimidation for now. Mockery is a great form of teaching. All the scripture writers practiced it. Elijah on Mount Carmel, he mocked the prophets of Baal who tried to call upon their God and this, their God wouldn't come, of course. The false God wouldn't come to consume the sacrifice on the altar. So Elijah says, maybe you better shout a little louder. Your God may be on vacation. Oh, maybe he's taking a nap. And those idiots shouted louder based on Elijah's mockery. Elijah's looking at his friends and going, what the, these guys are crazy. Hey, uh, and he continues to mock, mock, mock them. And Paul invents, his, uh, invents a word called the maim scission to mock the circumcision, telling them, you think it's some great religious right that's making you right with God? No, it's only an injuring of the flesh. They, I'm not going to call you the circumcision anymore. See, Paul has nicknames for people, right? I'm not going to, I'm calling the maim scission. That's like me calling, uh, I'm actually nicer than Paul was, calling the non pre existence of Christ people the Tories. I'm actually nicer than, than Paul. Paul's term was very derogatory. So mockery is fabulous way. Some people call it satire. It's the same thing, satire. A great way to expose folly is with satire. I've been using it for 30 years. It's been very effective for me. That's why I have all the views I have on YouTube, all the subscribers, because I'm satirical. I'm a smart ass with a purpose. I'm a smart ass with a purpose. I expose the lies. And I'm telling you, satire is the best way to do that, to make fun of it, to mock it. I will mock it every day. Until it's snatching away. Mock, my mockery breaks your heart. My mockery has brought thousands of people to the truth. Because I mock the error. And I, it brings it home to people in a way that never they would never would have gotten it before. Call it shock therapy. I don't call it whatever you want. It's effective. And I'm following Paul. I'm following Christ. I'm following Elijah. They all mocked their enemies. They mocked the religious institutions. And intimidation. Who is I intimidating? I don't intimidate anybody. I'm a soft-spoken guy. I put out my material on YouTube. People can watch it or not watch it. I don't even say subscribe to my channel, hit that notification bell. I don't care. I'm not. I don't intimidate anybody. So you must, uh, you must think that mockery or that intimidation is essentially connected to mockery. But I think you're 
making a mistake there. Those two don't go together by nature. And he commented again, and I, I got to close with this. And yes, admittedly, you do come across as arrogant in your videos, Dennis says. You do come across as arrogant. That's because I'm sure it comes across as arrogant because we live in such a politically correct world that anybody who states anything positively is looked to be arrogant. They, it, but it's not. It's not arrogance at all. It's knowing. It's being certain. And it's mocking the people who are wrong. And I got my example from Paul, from Christ, from the prophets, from everybody that ever taught anything in the word of God. That's where I take my cue from, these people. You know, brood of vipers, Jesus calls the, the Pharisees. Blind leaders of the blind. That is mockery. That is satire. Blind leaders of the blind. <laughs> I let the dead bury their own dead. Brutal satire. My goodness. Why does that break your heart? It's brought thousands of people to Christ. Ah, oh, breaks my heart that it breaks your heart. I just can't. Intimidation, I've never intimidated anybody. You do come across as arrogant. That's because I know stuff. And you're not supposed to know anything today, huh? No, no. Everybody's right in their own way. Everything is beautiful in its own way. Friends, I've had watch them and say the same. Friends, you've had watch the videos and say the same. But I have a feeling they keep watching. <laughs> My friends also say you're arrogant. You come across as arrogant, but they keep watching. You know, I know why they keep watching, because they like hearing somebody who's sure about what he's saying, who's confident, not in himself, but in God, confident in the word of God. That's why your friends watch. This guy's arrogant. I don't care what they think about me. I know I'm not arrogant. It sounds like I'm arrogant, but I'm not. I just know what I know. And God has given me the Holy Spirit. It's given me strength to be an evangelist and a teacher and to make black and white statements and to draw lines in the sand to say thus far and no farther to alert you when there are <clears throat> doctrines of demons afoot. I do find you entertaining. There you go. I do find you entertaining and sometimes provocative, which is why I tune in. Sometimes provocative? I take great offense to that. I do find you entertaining. Uh, that's by nature i don't set out to be entertaining i i'm not an entertainer it's just by nature i'm just just the way i am the show business is in my family i've told you that before with my uncle and both my uncles anyway so anyway thank you sincerely for all your hard work thank you dennis i appreciate that over the years i've read a lot of the same materials you reference and you've confirmed and clarified much of my understanding so probably talking about concordant materials there among others, probably. I do, however, hold my understanding with an open hand. See, that's what I don't. See, that, that, that's a big mistake. Dennis, I don't hold your understanding with an open hand. That means it can be taken. You hold your understanding with an open hand. I know people who do this. I have a friend living in Virginia right now, a woman who holds her understanding with an open hand, and she allows people to dabble with it, to pick at it, to try to talk her out of things that she knows. No, you hold your understanding with a closed hand. You hold it tightly because it's truth. The opposite is holding it with an open hand, and, and that gives you the susceptibility of being blown about by every wind, wind of teaching, and that's what's happened to my friend, blown about by every wind of teaching, hoping new un input will add to it. No, hoping new input will add to it. No, most of the time, new input changes it. Most of the time, everybody wants to hear something new, just like the philosophers at the Oropagus on Mars Hill. They just wanted to hear something new. Just wanted to hear something new. Well, I hold my understanding with an open palm because you never know. I might hear something new and it might take away what I have. And the one thing that will rob it better than anything is philosophy. Philosophy. See, hoping new input will add to it or even at times replace it. But you have the truth. Dennis finishes, that's my love for truth rather than my perception of it, as I've stated in previous comments. Thanks again. Okay, thank you, sir. This has been a glorious conversation. I appreciate it. I'm going long. I'm going to cut out for now, but uh, tomorrow will be full of surprises, even for me.